Our sermon text this morning is John 12, 36 to 43. And when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. And though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. And Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. This is the word of the Lord. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 12, John chapter 12, if you haven't already. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you... In the beginning, you said, let there be light, and there was light, God. And you have said through your Son, let there be life, and there has been life, God. And so we ask, ever so humbly, pleading with you, God, that you would open our eyes, that we would behold the light of your glory, God, that we would have life within us. God, we know that it is only in your Son that we live and move and have our being. So, God, let us turn nowhere else but to your Son. And in this text, this difficult text, let us see that you are good and you are worthy to be praised. Amen. There are two, two kinds of men in this world. Those that like to work with wood and those that like to work with metal. Share with you, with you, when you work with wood, someone made this pulpit, it's beautiful. When you work with wood, you gotta worry about the grain and the shading of it. Does it match up or not? And the stain, is it consistent? Oh, a little too much there. Don't wanna do that. And when you want to put it, put it together, you have those cute little wooden dowels and you drill little holes and put it together. But when you're working with metal, you can hit it, bang it, throw it around. You don't care about shading of this metal as long as it's beautiful cold rolled steel. That's all you need. So I don't want, I don't want, I, I like metal. I don't, want to, I don't want to sand something with a piece of paper. I don't want to do that. I want to grind it. I want to see sparks flying across the shop. That's what I want. I don't want to use a, a cute little saw. I don't want to use that to cut it. No. I want a plasma cutter. I want a torch, a nice acetylene torch. Jake knows this. Someone's not paying attention to the shop. A little more oxygen, make it pop, wake them up. I don't want to glue it together, the cute little ends together. No. I want to get the 23 or 35 MIG welder. I don't want to melt the metal together. That's what I want to do. Remember, your vertical welds go up for strength, down for beauty, all those tricks. And when you're welding, you can tack weld things in place, but you do that long enough, you don't quite close your eyes in time. 
and you'll burn them. You're going to end up going to see Gavin. And you end up wearing sunglasses for a couple days because your eyes hurt. So then you throw on the, the mask, the helmet, and you have this glorious light right in front of you. And you can feel the heat coming off. You have a nice tan. You have your welding gloves up to here, and then your t-shirt, like, make a six-inch tan. It's beautiful. <laughs> and there is this glorious light that's powerful enough. You can feel the heat, and it can blind you, but with your helmet on, you can turn it so dark that you can't even see it. Now imagine having this radiant light there in front of you, but you are unable to see it. That's what we see in our text today. You see, you see Christ and all that he has done before them, but they are unable to see it. Why? Because God has blinded their eyes and they're unable to comprehend what they have seen before them. So what do we do this week? Open your eyes to see the glory of God. Open your eyes to see the glory of God. First part, we're going to take a look at verses 36 through 37. You're going to see these signs and the unbelief. All of the signs that Christ has done before them, yet in the midst of that, they still have unbelief. Why? Next verses. Because of their ordained unbelief. And we'll take some time and look at Isaiah. Then, Lord willing, if we have time, we're going to look at verses 41 through 43, which is the pursuing a greater glory. Don't settle for the glory of this world, but pursue a greater glory. So just to recap where we've been, we're in the, in the throes of this Holy Week in the Gospel of John. That's what's happening. Christ has been anointed for his burial. And then he has had his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he's, he's weaving together all of these threads, this thread of David, this eternal king, this thread of, of Solomon of riding a donkey, this thread of Jehu, the king that brings and exacts God's judgment over his enemies as he is having the cloaks thrown down in front of him. And Christ, as he taught, Christ in his meekness will inherit the earth. And part of that, as we talked about last week, how he will inherit the earth, is that he's like a, a head of wheat that dies and goes into the ground. And because of his death and through his death, there is an abundance of life. So he has these hours of suffering before him. But he doesn't turn away. His only prayer is, Father, glorify your name. And then we come to our text here. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not, they still did not believe him. Think of all that Christ has done. Think of it all. Go back to, go back to chapter 2. You have this wedding. You have this wedding in Cana, and when he turns the water in the wine, the, the water of this signifying the, the old, the law, is, it's run dry. But he doesn't make wine. He actually uses that. He fills it up. And out of that comes this beautiful wine, which is a sign of the new kingdom. 
and a wedding that is also characterized by a sign of the new kingdom that is to come. And after that, right after that, still in chapter 2, you have the cleansing of the temple. Just Christ is saying, the temple, the, the presence of God is being cleansed out. There is a new temple and that I am the presence of God. You destroy this body and I will raise it up. You destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. They didn't get it, obviously. But he was speaking of the temple the temple of his body. Chapter 4, you have the healing of the nobleman, the nobleman's son. Christ is again is in Cana, and the nobleman's son is in Capernaum, roughly 20 miles away. Christ doesn't even need to go into the presence of this son who is ill, and he heals him from 20 miles away. And this royal official leaves and his servants come to him and they know it was right at that exact hour when Christ said that he was human. Chapter 5, you have this, the third sign. You have this healing of Bethesda. 38 years this man was waiting to walk. 38 years. And he would go to the pool and wait for it to stir, and then he would try to go in. But it wasn't the pool that stirred that brought his healing. It was the, the stirring within the heart of Christ that brought him healing. It's right on, this happens right on the north side, right outside of the temple, right on the north side, a stone throw away from the temple. The Pharisees didn't get it. The people they didn't get it. And you have the feeding of the multitude, you have five loaves and two fish, feeding five thousand people. John all these signs before this, yet they don't believe he he was a blind man in John chapter nine. Sixth sign. And he says, I am the light of the world. Though you were blind, I will be the one to open your eyes, Christ says, so that you will see. And then we have this raising of Lazarus. Not only, not only hunger and joy and feasting, finding its fulfillment of Christ, and blindness and illness, but death. Can you overcome death? Absolutely. Lazarus. He proclaims life out of his mouth into the tomb of death. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out. Yet, they still did not believe in you. Perhaps you're sitting there wondering, how, how is this possible? To see all of these works, but still not yet believe. Well, and it was, it's, this is what John told us was going to happen in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. He was in the world, Christ, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Verse 11, chapter 1. He came into his own, and his own people, his own people did not receive him. All of these arrows pointing towards Christ, and they're unable to see it. John actually records the least amount of miracles that transpire. But even in the end, he's saying, there's so many other things that I could have written. that the, If I would have written them in detail, the books would have filled the whole world. But what we see is enough to see Christ. So we look at them and say, how are you able to not see it? But what about you? In your unbelief? Haven't you seen enough of creation to know that there is a God? Haven't you been pricked in your own heart, even by your conscience, to know that you have sinned? Even though 
You don't read the law of God. You're still kept awake at night because of your conscience. How will you atone for those sins? Our only hope is to walk in the light and open your eyes and to live in the light and to walk while you have the light and to believe in the light, as Christ said in our previous verses. But what if you're like me for so many years of your life? You hear and you see but you are unable to believe. Why does that happen? Why? Why do missionaries labor away for generations and see very little fruit? Very commonly. Why does that happen? Why are some of you able to recite Bible verse upon Bible verse, story upon story, yet you do not believe? Let's go back to the text. Verse 38. You see, they still did not believe in him so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has binded up their hearts and hard, binded up their, blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn. And God, in His goodness and faithfulness, and I would heal them. A couple things. One, this is why we preach through a book of the Bible at a time. I would choose to preach these verses about as quickly as I would choose to grab a hold of some electric wires. Two other things before we look at the text. Number one, a friend of mine, a mentor, uh, has told me, when you come to texts like this or situations, difficult situations in life, you have the, the text or the event that's happening here, and then you have people. You're going to be tempted to think about your dear friend who doesn't believe, your dear grandmother who doesn't believe, or even your children who walk in unbelief. You're going to be tempted to think about them and read the text through them. Just cover them up for a little bit. Cover them up so that we might look at the text and look at the text alone and see how beautiful and how glorious it is. Then, we can add these people in, but we read the text first and we understand them and their unbelief through the text. Make sense? That's number one. Number two, when you come to verses like this, and truth like this, you just got to let it simmer. You can't rush through it. How quickly are we to read verses like this? Therefore, they could not believe. Why? Because he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. We're so quick to read that and then go, yeah, but. And we come down with a hard case of the yeah, buts. God is blinded their eyes. Yeah, but God so loved the world. He has hardened their hearts. Yeah, but he wills that none should perish. We don't need to diminish and water down one truth of God to make another more palatable. Make sense? So if this is difficult and hard to understand and digest, you don't water it down and then kind of coat it over with some other verses. No, all of God's truth works together and they uphold one another. And if we don't understand it, pray to God that he would give you understanding. Don't come down with a case of the yeah buts. We don't have to explain it away. 
As Christians, we do not have to explain it away, but we must conform all of our hearts to the Word of God. So you see this in Isaiah. You can turn there if you like. It's Isaiah 53. Two quotes from Isaiah. Uh, the first one is from Isaiah 53. The second one is from Isaiah 6. Let's look at the first one, Isaiah 53. This is in the, right in the middle of this suffering servant song. There's four songs of the suffering servant throughout Isaiah. I, I would say John, the gospel of John, is actually just a commentary, more or less on Isaiah. It's like a revised edition. Oh, the Messiah has come. Let's write a second edition. There are so many parallels that are happening on, and they play with each other so beautifully, so beautifully. So you, you see this, this, you're going to have this exalted servant that Isaiah is talking about. So that song actually begins in chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. He said that to explain what kind of death he would have on the cross. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any other man and his form more than the sons of man. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see and what they had not heard they will understand. Enter in our verse. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed our message? The implication here is no one. Why do you think they're going to reject this Messiah? Why do you think you keep going down? Why would he bear our griefs? Why would he be pierced through? Why would he be oppressed and afflicted? Because they didn't believe him. Who has believed our message? No one. Paul picks it up in the same way in Romans chapter 10. There he's talking about the gospel going to the Gentiles. It's true there as well. You have these beautiful feet that are going out into the world bringing the gospel everywhere. And then Paul says, quotes Isaiah, and he says, who has believed our message? Who has believed what he heard from us? No one. That's why Paul is able to say, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Isaiah is ministering in the, in the midst of these people that will not believe. Isaiah chapter 29, it says, For the Lord has poured out on you a spirit of deep sleep, and has closed your eyes, the prophets, and has covered your head, the seers. Isaiah chapter 30, For there are rebellious people, lying children, children, unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. Who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more, they say. Let us hear no more of the Holy One of Israel. So Isaiah is ministering in a time of unbelief, and they will not, and they cannot Believe what they have heard. And then it says, okay, so who has believed our message? No one. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Arm of the Lord throughout Isaiah, is, I would say, is Christ. Oftentimes, it's this picture of the, the, the sovereign control, either judgment or upholding upon the nation. You see, the arm of the Lord has been holding them in judgment. But then Isaiah chapter 40, you see this one who is going to come and by his arms, he will, like a shepherd, gather his sheep. Obviously, John 10, that is Christ. So to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, actually, in the previous chapter, look in verse 10, 52, verse 10. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all nations. 
Let the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. So they will see it. Who's believing? No one. Who has seen the arm of the Lord? Everyone. Why? Let's go back to our text. Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah says, so John's saying, okay, here's, if, if that doesn't convince you, let me give you another quote from Isaiah to show you how this works. Isaiah chapter 6, you can turn there. Therefore they could not believe for again, Isaiah has said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest, that's the hard part, that's the one you've got to wrestle with, lest they would see with their eyes and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. So here is Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah has died, he saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, and in the train of his robe filled the temple. Then you have the seraphim flying with the six wings, two that cover their faces, with two that cover their feet, and with two they fly. And Isaiah sees this. He sees the glory. He sees the glory of Yahweh. And what's his response? What was me? I'm a wretched sinner, and I will die seeing this revelation of God. That's the proper response. Verse 8 of chapter 6. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I said, Me. <laughs> I like this. I like seeing the glory of God. I would love to tell people about this glory that I've just seen. S send me. Verse 9. Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of the people insensitive and their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their hearts and understand with their hearts and return and be healed which is what John's just quoting. God will harden their hearts. Why? So that judgment can come upon them. How long will this last, Isaiah asked? Until the cities are devastated and without inhabitation. God has blinded their eyes so that they might receive the just judgment for their sin. Could they turn? Not while he blinds them. This is also true not only in the day of Christ as he qu quotes it. Not only true in the time of Isaiah, but also even with Pharaoh. This is true also with Pharaoh. God has hardened his heart. I think there's almost 20. I'm, I'm sure I missed some going through it. But I think there's almost 20 references about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart or him hardening his own heart or the, heart, the hearts of the Israelites being hardened. Exodus 4, verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Pharaoh, or go back to Egypt, then see... Go back to Egypt and see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders that I have put in your power. But he will see the signs, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Keeps going on. Chapter 7. I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Verse 13. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not listen to them. He sees Aaron's staff. He sees all the miracles. Yet God hardened his heart and he was unable to comprehend what was happening. 
Next verse, verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Same chapter. The magicians of Egypt did the same with their secrets. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord said. It's not his doing. It's the Lord's doing. When the Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen. It goes on and on. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and the thunder had ceased. He sinned again and hardened his heart. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. I have hardened. Next verse, chapter 10. I've hardened his heart. It goes on and on until you get to chapter 14. Not even Pharaoh's heart. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go after them and I will be honored and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all of his army what's the chief end of this then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord You see this again and again and again. That God has placed his hands over their eyes so that they cannot see that which is right before them. Like you have this glorious light when you're welding and you cannot even see it. How much more when you see the work of God, but you don't really see it. So let me be very clear. This hasn't been clear enough. God has placed his hands over some people's eyes so that they cannot see his glory. They cannot taste of his grace. They cannot comprehend his goodness. And they will not turn. They will not repent. And they will go to hell forever. As Christians, how do you respond to this? What do you, when though this, this is happening to those whom you love, what if it's your children? Who will have the hand of God over their eyes? What if it's your parents and they refuse to repent? What if it's your, your spouse who apparently has the hand of God over their eyes and they will not repent? Brother, sister, will you still love God? Do you love God so much that you are able to hold all of them with this open hand? That's the question. That's if you're a believer. If you're an unbeliever, there's two responses. One is that you hate this, sheer hatred. I, th I thought first apathy, but I realized, nah, there's no really apathy towards God. Either you love him or you hate him. You might think you're apathetic, but it's not really the state you're in. You're just blind. If you're an unbeliever and you see this and you hate it, but you're, you, you love it because it gives you your excuse for not worshiping God. And just like Pharaoh, who in turn, after God hardening and hardening and hardening and hardening Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh in turn hardens his own heart. And you see and you hear a truth like this, and your heart becomes hard. And you become like Pharaoh, who with his head is imaging the serpent, right? How he's dressed. 
is imaging the serpent here on earth and you're just like him. Or if you're an unbeliever and you come to this truth and you hear that the hand of God and his judgment is not going to be upon you in hell, but is already upon you now. It brings you great fear and brings you great dread. And you find yourself dreadfully afraid that this sovereign God has hell hanging over you, waiting to pour it out upon you. And he's already blinding your eyes. And you hear that. And you see that in this text. Well, if that is you, that's the first step of God opening your eyes. That you might see the light and walk in the light. So what does all this happen? We're going to wrap it up here. Why does all of this happen? All of this happens for God's glory. Every single bit of it. Wait, you're telling me that God's blinding of people is for his glory? Absolutely. So that when we do believe, you will know it is not of you at all. From the beginning to the end, God Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the author and the perfecter of your faith. That we are unable to take this first step of faith. You can't take it apart from Christ. Removing his hands and so that you might behold the glory of God. And that he will be glorified then in all that you do. And as we, the saints of God, await even further revelations of, glory, of the glory of God that will happen throughout all of eternity, as he will open up our eyes and our hearts and our minds even more and more throughout all of eternity, you can't exhaust his glory. So all of this even works to the glory of God, even those where the hand stays over their eyes. they too will glorify God. This is sobering, but they will glorify God by their inability to see God apart from Him moving and stirring their hearts. So pursue the greater glory. You see it here before you plead with God that He would open your eyes and open your hearts that you would see the full glory of God in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. God, we ask that you would open up our eyes to behold the glory of your Son. God, that all the glory would go to Christ through this. Let us, not, let us never be haughty or prideful in our faith, God. Let us be humbled, knowing that any, any glimmer we see of your goodness and of your glory are, is only done by your Spirit moving in us. But God, we turn to you, knowing that your Son has never Turned away a man who asked to be healed of blindness. God, we turn to you and ask that you would give us more sight. As we come to communion, God, open up our eyes to behold the glory of what we are partaking and participating in as a body of Christ and how your Son is glorified through all things. And all God's people said, Amen.